Good morning. I'm Jan Cope, Provost of the Cathedral, and on behalf of our Bishop and Dean and Cathedral community, it's my joy and privilege to welcome you to our service this morning. Those of you who are worshiping with us in the nave and those of you who are worshiping with us online. This is a special day in the cathedral's life in that we call this Cathedral Day. 109 years ago, in a few days, the foundation stone of this cathedral was laid and we mark that and celebrate that in a variety of ways. When you came in this morning, you received an announcement sheet that looks like this. I bring that to your attention. There are a few things I would like to highlight for you uh, this morning. Immediately following this service, we gather for our festive annual Congregation and Cathedral Community Picnic. It will be held on the east end of the cathedral on the lawn outside. I can't think of a more glorious day for a picnic. There will be children's ministries, door prizes, food and fellowship, and do not worry if you've not RSVP, there will be tickets available on site. Please just come and celebrate our community life together. This afternoon at 4 p.m., we have another joyful occasion to celebrate at this cathedral in that at our Evensong service, we will be installing two diocesan honorary canons, two beloved priests of this community, Stuart Kenworthy and Preston Hannibal. So please do come back or just stay for the afternoon and join us for that celebration as well. Next Sunday, October 2nd, is our annual Blessing of the Animals at 2.30 p.m. on Walker Court. It is one of the happiest and yappiest occasions at the cathedral. We invite you to come, bring your pets, or just adopt and claim the ones who come. It's a great opportunity in the spirit of St. Francis. And speaking of animals, you may have noticed a special bronze exhibition that we have on Walker's Court, the Carnival of the Animals, all in conjunction with the blessing of the animals and the whimsy and wonder of this glorious place. At this time, I invite you to still yourselves for a time apart with God.
I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Bless the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthy magnify your holy name. For Christ our Lord. On the anniversary of the dedication of this cathedral, Almighty God, to whose glory we celebrate the dedication of this house of prayer, we give you thanks for the fellowship of those who have worshiped in this place. And we pray that all who seek you here may find you and be filled with your joy and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep with you wherever you go, and will bring you back in this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely 
the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. The word of the Lord. reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice, of all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Jesus said to the Pharisees, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets they should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. O Lord, uphold thou me, that I may uplift thee. Amen. Please be seated. On September 29th, 1907, a few days short of 109 years ago, the foundation stone of this cathedral was laid. 10,000 people stood on top of Mount St. Alban for the ceremony. And interestingly, I learned not long ago that my great-grandmother was among the gathered crowd. President Teddy Roosevelt spoke, and this house of prayer for all people was born. Then, 83 years later, on September 29, 1990, President George Bush spoke as this cathedral was dedicated and the last 1,000-pound finial 
was raised and put in place. 1990 may have marked the end of construction, but cathedrals, like the human soul, are never finished. They are always works in progress, and the people who lead them and love them must continually grow and learn to reach out and minister to a hurting world in ways that speak to each new generation. So on this Cathedral Day, we give thanks to all those upon whose shoulders we stand, those who worked and sacrificed and dreamed to make the Washington National Cathedral a reality, those who put everything into the creation of this place and yet many, many of them who never saw this place's completion. At the same time, today we remind ourselves that our work is far from over and that our ministry in this place is far from complete. Just the other day, Jan Cope and I were talking a little bit about our history and reflecting on the determination and hard work of some of our founders. In particular, we were discussing Bishop Henry Yates Satterley, the first bishop of the Diocese of Washington, and the driving force behind the founding of this cathedral. Bishop Satterley believed in the importance of a national church that sought to bring all people together in a house of prayer. So determined was Bishop Satterley to see this cathedral constructed that in 1898, when he found these 57 acres of land on top of Mount St. Alban, he personally, personally guaranteed a $145,000 mortgage to purchase this land. Personally guaranteed. That is the equivalent of a $4 million mortgage today. Satterley was willing to risk everything he had in order to make this cathedral a reality. And that is amazing dedication. This building and its history are things of which we can and should be proud. But our gospel for this morning reminds us that even as we celebrate our history, we must never forget what matters most. Because it isn't what we have that matters to God. It's what we do with what we have that matters to God. It's how we use the blessings of this life or fail to use them that has a lasting effect on the health of our souls. The parable of Lazarus and the rich man, which we heard this morning, is unique to the Gospel of Luke. And its purpose, its purpose is not to tell us what may or may not happen to us in the next life after we die. Its purpose is not to teach about heaven and hell. Rather, the purpose of the parable is to teach us something important about this life. Dives is the traditional name of the rich man in the parable, spelled D-I-V-E-S. It comes from the Latin word for rich. And we should be clear that Dives was not the bad man in the story, while Lazarus was the good man. The parable is not that simple. It is not a parable trying to say that the wealthy are evil and the poor are good. No, this, this is a parable about mercy. Lazarus goes to the bosom of Abraham when he dies because of the mercy of God. Dives, the rich man, when he dies, goes to hell because he failed to show any mercy at all. He failed to show mercy to the poor man who literally lived outside his front door. 
It's a powerful story. Dives lives in comfort. He wears good clothes. He owns a nice house. He eats well. Lazarus has nothing at all. He lives on the street and hangs out around the rich man's trash cans, hoping to get just a little bit of food. Not only is Lazarus poor and hungry, but he is covered by sores so pungent that they attract stray dogs. I can only imagine how it must have ruined Dive's morning to come outside every day and see such a person living so close to his front door. I am sure the rich man's only wish was that Lazarus would go away and find some other piece of the street to live on. But it is this rich man who gets the message in the long run. For after death, he finds himself confined to the torments of hell while Lazarus is sent to spend eternity, eternity with Father Abraham. Again, this rich man is not condemned for being rich, but for being blind to the needs of others. He's condemned for being uncaring to the needs of the poor. Dives did nothing to soften the living hell that Lazarus had known all of his life, and so he was destined to discover his own hell after death. It is a formidable parable about the abuse of power and privilege by the wealthy at the expense of the poor and the marginalized. Did you know that this, this is the parable that changed Albert Schweitzer's life? It was hearing this parable and a sermon on this parable that convicted this famous philosopher and theologian and musicologist of his need to care for the poor. And as a result, Schweitzer spent much of his career as a missionary in Africa, providing medical care for thousands of the world's poorest. Did you know that this parable also deeply affected Charles Dickens, whose character Jacob Marley in A Christmas Carol echoes the plea of Dives to warn his brothers when Marley comes back from the grave to warn Scrooge. Christian, charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business, Marley tells a trembling Scrooge. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. There's a great little story that you may have heard about a lake that died. The water in this lake had once been clear and pure the kind of water in which you can dip your cup and get a clear, fresh drink. But the lake over time became stagnant and choked with algae. What had once been a source of life for people and animals died. Drinking the water made people sick. Then the reason for the lake's demise was discovered. Debris had collected at the end of the lake preventing the free flow of water. The free flow of water not into the lake, but out of the lake. When the spillway was cleared, the lake became fresh and clean and filled with life again. I think that this is what our parable is trying to tell us. The rich man in our story for today was doing his best to hold on to all that he could, barely allowing any seepage of his wealth or his power outside of the gate. Now there was plenty of evidence that this behavior was killing him, smothering him, putting him into a stagnant hell. And Luke says that there is a price to be paid if we forget what matters most. 
Our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, said it best in a talk he gave shortly after his consecration. God came among us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth to show us the way, Bishop Curry said. He came to show us the way to life, the way to love. He came to show us the way beyond what often can be the nightmares of our own devisings into the dream of God's intending. That's why when Jesus called his first followers, he did it with the simple words, follow me. Follow me and love will show you how to become more than you ever dreamed you could be. Follow me and I will help you change the world from the nightmare it often is into the dream that God intends. My brothers and sisters, on this Cathedral Day, let us never forget that our task is not to cling to this grand edifice as tightly as we can in order to preserve it, but to open it up in such a way that the love and the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ spills out of our doors. Our task is not to cling to what we have, but to open our hearts and our hands and our lives to serve the living Christ, not only by what we proclaim on top of this mount, but by the way we leave the mount and serve the wider world. Because as Bishop Curry reminds us, now is our time to go, to go into the world to share the good news of Christ, to go into the world and to be instruments of God's reconciliation, to let the world know that there is a God who loves us, a God who will not let us go, and that that love can set us all free. Amen. The ancient affirmation of faith, known as the Nicene Creed, gives us opportunity as one to affirm our faith. Those who wish to do so, please pray and affirm together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. We believe in the Holy Spirit. His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us.
us pray for Christ's church and the world responding, receive our thanks and prayers, O Christ. Almighty God, through the ages you have moved your people to build houses of prayer and praise and to set apart places for the ministry of holy word and sacraments. On this anniversary of the dedication of this cathedral church, we will fill these walls with prayers for your church universal and for the world worthy of your great love. Praying in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, the head of the church and the source of our hope and salvation. For the church universal, of which this cathedral church is a visible symbol, receive our thanks and prayer, O Christ. For this worshiping community, as we remember your promise that when two or three are gathered in your name, you're there in the midst of them. Receive our thanks and praise, O Christ. For this place, that we may be still and know God. Receive our thanks and praise, O God. For the fulfilling of our desires and petitions as you see best for us, receive our thanks and praise, O Christ. For your blessings in the past and for a vision of the future, receive our thanks and praise, O Christ. For a foretaste of your eternal kingdom in the sacrament of the Eucharist, receive our thanks and praise, O Christ. For the faith of those who have gone before us, that we may be encouraged by their perseverance and sacrifice, receive our thanks and praise, O Christ. For all who have died in the peace of Christ and are at rest, receive our thanks and praise. For the fellowship with Peter and Paul and all your saints, receive our thanks and praise. O oh Christ. As was prayed on September 30th, 1990, at the dedication of this cathedral, we pray, Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks for setting the minds and hearts of your people to proclaim your word and to work your will, especially through the offerings and opportunities of this cathedral church. Inspire its ministry so that the knowledge of your truth in the world might be increased. Broaden its mission so that lives might be ennobled and lifted up as examples of your boundless and loving care. Remember those who have built before us that we too may be builders of compassion and concord. And finally, we raise up to you, O Lord, the hopes and aspirations of all in this good land, that our heritage of faith may not falter, and that in your light we may follow the paths of justice and hope through the grace and love of Christ, the true foundation stone, we pray. Amen. And using these words of confession, let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. And with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we only repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. And we make the light of your will and walk in your ways.
May Almighty God have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May the peace of Christ be always with you. Please take a moment to share a greeting with one another. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Randy Hollerith. I'm Dean of the Cathedral, and on behalf of the Bishop and all of us here, we want to welcome you again. We're so glad that you're with us this morning on this very special day as we celebrate a Cathedral Day. At this point, we move from the Liturgy of the Word to the Liturgy of the Table. And all those who desire to know Christ are welcome and invited to come and receive the Eucharist this morning. If you would rather not receive the Eucharist, we invite you to come forward anyway and cross your hands over your chest so that we just might share a prayer with you this morning. Also, if you need a gluten-free wafer, we have those available, just ask. And if you are in need of healing for yourself or on behalf of others in your life that you love and know who are in need of healing, once you receive communion, uh, to my left in the St. John's Chapel, there will be healing ministers available to pray with you if you would like. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And now we give you thanks for your blessing on this house of prayer, where through your grace we offer you the sacrifice of praise and are built by your spirit into a temple made without hands, even the body of your Son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, O God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you. Serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen. 
good of the soul, the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Together, let us pray our prayer after communion. Father in heaven, whose church on earth is a sign of your heavenly peace, an image of the new And now may the peace of God, which surpasses human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen.
like living stones precious in his sight, go in peace to proclaim the mighty acts of God.